The Lord be with you. Thank you. Friends, welcome in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have been gathered in this place as the baptized people of God to lift up our voices in praise and in prayer. We've come to listen for God's word to us on this day. We've come trusting that God meets us in this place and that God will then send us out to be his people in Timnath, in Windsor, in Fort Collins, and wherever he sends us. Friends, you are welcome here in the name of God. As we gather in for worship this morning, I would ask if there are any announcements or news to be shared for the good of the community. Hi. I, hello. Hello. I think um, next Sunday is going to be Flower Sunday because it's supposed to freeze. So bring a vase and I'm going to clean out my gardens and you can all take home a bouquet. Okay. Thanks, Russ. So if you want flowers next week, bring a vase and Russ will. It's a tradition. Well, I'm learning something new every day. I would like to announce our tea again, the Quester's Tea, December 4th at the church. Everyone is welcome. Uh, I know some of the ladies have come before and really enjoyed it. Uh, it's a fundraiser for restoration and preservation in the community. And see me for tickets. Okay, thank you. So that, what's the date for that tea again? December 4th. December 4th, okay. I want to thank you for the prayers for my daughter and to let you know that she is improving and probably will be able to go back to work tomorrow. Just pointing out the announcement in the bulletin about a special fellowship time that we're having next Sunday, um, October 10th, to say thank you and farewell to Debbie Roger and June Haynes, um, who are moving um, out of state and have been very important and loved members of our congregation for many years. So that's next Sunday after church. Okay, thanks, Phyllis. Okay, now, today is the last Sunday. You can give me corrections, additions, or deletions from the church calendar. Um, if you are not on our church calendar, Please write your birthday and if you're married, your anniversary day um, down and I will be glad to add it to our church calendar. Uh, it's just a fun thing to have and the calendars are free. And so um, if you haven't already seen me or haven't already done it, please do so. Uh, would love to have that information added to our calendar. Yes. Yes. I uh, want to say I'm very grateful for all your prayers and uh, support during this time. I, I was in the hospital from the 22nd through 25th, I believe, um, and uh, I uh, really had a very difficult time. I have diabetes and syphilis, and it, it's very rare. And uh, so I um, went through a lot. My sodium level went down to 121. It could have slipped down to 110 uh, very easily, but my wife called the ambulance at 2 a.m., on early Wednesday morning, and um, I could have slept down like another 10 points, and that could have been pr possibly fatal or or, or uh, at least in a coma or something. So I'm very grateful to my wife, but I'm also very grateful for all the support of uh, this church and uh, your prayers. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gary. We're glad you're here. Well, friends, this is World Communion Sunday in the church, a Sunday what we remember that as we gather at this table together, we also gather as one body with Christians of every tribe and tongue and nation, a body that no borders or languages or races can separate. We are one in Christ. And so as we worship today, as we lift up our voices, we remember that we do so with saints all over the world on this day. 
So as we enter into worship now, let us do so remembering that, and let us do so with a discipline of silence and the ringing of the bell. Oh, sorry. Two more quick announcements. <laughs> <laughs> One is it's kind of chilly in here this morning. We apologize for that, but for some reason the heater's not working. We will get it fixed for next week. Second announcement is if you're a first-time visitor, if you would give us a wave, we have a gift for you back at the back of the church. Any first-time visitors? Very good. Lyndall's getting, getting you a gift back there. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this morning. Now let us prepare our hearts for worship with the discipline of silence and the ringing of the bell. Thank you, Joan. If you would join me in the call to worship found in your bulletin this morning. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. 
Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. If you would join us in singing our first hymn this morning, number 488 in the hymnal, The God of Abraham Praise. Stand if you are able. We know that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us in freedom and hope confess the wrong we have done. Let us pray. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The profit and the pleasures we pursue lay waste the land and pollute the seas. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse our good gifts of imagination and freedom of intellect and reason and turned them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us, heal and forgive us, set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear the good news. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, though who, through who we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you.
Father, to the Son, and the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. may be seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have spoken to us through your Son. Let your written word now be spoken and heard by each of us. Give us ears to hear and hearts to understand that we may not refuse your calling or ignore your voice. May we all be taught by you through your powerful word. Bring our every thought captive to obeying Christ. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Our first scripture this morning comes from Psalm 105 verses 21 through 26. It can be found in your pew Bible on page 556 and 57. Hear the word. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and his judgments he uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He is mindful of his covenant forever, of the world that he commanded, of the thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statue to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion of an inheritance. When they, are, when they were few in number of little account and strangers in it, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people, he allowed one, no one to oppress them, He rebuked kings on their account, saying, Do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. When he summoned famine against the land and broke every staff of bread, he had sent a man ahead of him, ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters, his neck was put in a collar of iron until what he had said came to pass. The word of the Lord kept testing him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the peoples set him free. He made himself lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to instruct his officials at his place. Have you ever seen a bush that was burning or a tree that was burning? Yeah, it, was, it kind of, might be kind of scary, and I think Moses is kind of scary, but what he noticed was that bush was, was actually never, never consumed by the fire. And so he says, well, I'm, I'm the bush, he says, basically the a voice of God came out and says, I am God. I am, I'm the one who's going to t- gonna lead you, you know, out of the, um, Egypt here and, and, and let you have the promised land of milk and honey. 
And one of the things that he said at the very last, though, when Moses asked him, well, who, who sent me? And, and God says, I am. Now, can you see our banners up there that we have up here? And these, these banners were actually what Jesus said he was here. But two, one of the things he said, uh, Jesus was the I am also. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega over here. I am what he says, one true God. And over here, he is the one true vine. Uh, and he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. And over here, he says, I'm the light of the world. I'm the good shepherd. And so he says all these things that say, I am. And so back then, God was kind of saying, uh, he says, well, I am the great I am. I, I, if someone asks who's going to help us get out of this, this Egypt place that we're in, and God says, I am. Okay, and he says, well, who's, who's going to help us defeat our enemies? I am. So he kept saying, I am. And it's kind of funny now that if we kind of say, you know, who's, who's going to help me if I'm having problems at school? Actually, Jesus is there to say, I am. Just count on me. I, c I can help you out here. And so this, the I am, is both refers to both, I think, God and then to Jesus now. So what I'm going to do now, though, is I'm going to sing a little song here that I wrote many years ago, actually, and it's called I Am, and it's going to talk about uh, the, some of the things that Jesus said I am. So you can sit here. You, if you guys want to sit up here with Phyllis, you can, okay? Jesus was a preaching in the villages and towns. He met a leper man along the way. He said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus said, be clean, I am. I am the salvation. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd, the way, the truth, the life. I am the resurrection, I am the first and last, I am the life forever, I am that I am. When a servant of the guard lay stiff and paralyzed, Jesus told the guard that he would come to see. Then the guard said, say the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus said, it's done because you have believed. I am the salvation. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd, the way, the truth, the life. I am the resurrection. I am the first and last. I am the life forever. I am that I am. When the elders and the priests and the teachers of the law wanted Pilate to have Jesus crucified, Pilate asked him if he was in fact the Son of God. Jesus said, you're right when you say I am. I am the salvation. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd, the way, the truth, the life. I am the resurrection. I am the first and last. I am the life forever. I am that I am. I am the life forever. I am that I am. Let's have a little prayer here. God, thank you for being the I am for us. When we need help, you raise your hand and says, I am here. Thank you for all you do for us, and thank you for being with us all the time. Amen.
hopefully that's a good sign. So over the past uh, few weeks, uh, if you've been here, you know we've been leaping through stories in the Old Testament, um, listening to parts and pieces of God's big story and finding our place in it. Story of God's good creation, uh, the call and testing of Abraham and Isaac, the dream of Jacob. We've been tracking on God's story. Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, had 12 sons. One of the sons' names you might know is Joseph, who was also a dreamer. In fact, his dreams got him into trouble. His brothers hated him. They sold him into slavery. He ended up in Egypt, as we heard in our psalm this morning. But there in Egypt, out of God's providence, God's provision, Joseph rose from slave to someone like a prince in the land, second only to the king, to Pharaoh. And Joseph administered the land of Egypt. And when famine struck, Joseph made sure that Egypt had provision. And so peoples from all over the region came to Egypt looking for help, including Joseph's own family, his father and his brothers. So there in Egypt, Joseph and his family were reconciled, and they prospered, they settled down, they multiplied. But eventually Joseph died, and a king, a pharaoh, rose in Egypt who did not remember Joseph or the good he did. He saw the multitude of Hebrews in his land, and out of fear he enslaved them. And out of that slavery... The people of God, the Israelites, cried out. Which is where we pick up the story this morning. Listen carefully and listen well, for this too is God's word for us from the book we love. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant, his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took notice of them. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of a bush. And the bush was blazing. Moses looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and see, look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that Moses had turned to see, God spoke to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. He said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place in which you're standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. 
I also have seen how the Egyptians have oppressed them. So, come. I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring your people, the Israelites, out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this will be a sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Together we say, thanks be to God. Holy God, once again, we place our lives open before your open word. We ask that you would do now what only you can in the power of your spirit, which is to make this a word for each and every one of us here today and a way in which we know you coming down, drawing near, present with us through your living word, Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name, and together we say, Amen. It happens, I think, at least once a week. Everything is going great. The sun is shining, because we live in Colorado after all. Dinner's on the stove. There's a a beverage in my glass. I'll let you decide what the beverage is. I'm, maybe I'm, I'm chatting with my wife, Annie. Hun, how was your day? Everything's great. And then, ah, a cry rises up in our house. Sometimes the cry is accompanied with an accursed name. Ephraim! That's my son's name. Sometimes the cry invokes help. Daddy, she's scratched. Sometimes the cry is just accompanied with tears, but a cry rises in our household. Can anybody else relate to this? I've got a witness. <laughs> Parents, grandparents, what do you do when the cry rises? You probably know that it's often not enough to simply say, you're fine, work it out. I mean, sometimes that's necessary, right? But many times, what, what is wanted? What is needed? But for you, having heard the situation, right, to see it, to step in, to kneel down, to be there, right? They want you there. As we open the book of Exodus, as we listen to our story this morning, a cry rises up. Did you hear it? The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up. And again, I have heard their cry, and again, the cry of the Israelites has now come. A cry rises up. And it's not simply the cry of young sibling rivalry, toddlers tossing each other around. It's the cry of mothers whose sons have been slaughtered. It's the cry of fathers under the whip of taskmasters. It's a cry 
not unlike one which has risen in our country years ago and all over the world today. It's a cry of a people whose history is full of promise and blessing, but who here are broken under the weight of 400 plus years of slavery. Out of that, out of that slavery, a cry for help rises in a seemingly helpless situation. They can do nothing for themselves. A cry rises up. And God hears. Actually, though, maybe you notice it's more than that, isn't it? God takes notice of the situation, and God responds to it. And there are three phrases, three things God says that sort of capture God's response. I want you to hear with me this morning. God says, I have. God says, I will. And God says, I am. I have, I will, I am. God says, I have. It's verse 7 onward, if you have your Bible open. Then the Lord said, I have observed, seen the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know, and that's not just up here, but here, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them. That's the first response of God. I have seen, I have heard, I have come down. A cry rises up, and God does not stand aside as the passive parent. It's fine, it'll work out eventually. A cry rises up, and God does not sit aloft like some unmoved monarch, indifferent to the sufferings of his people. A cry rises up, and God does not simply look on as though through a window from heaven, sympathizing, but safely removed. A cry rises from God's people in God's world, which he made to be good, and God acts. God draws near. God is intimately attentive. I have seen, I have heard I have come, which I think is just part, at least, of what the burning bush scenario is about. For all the ways that we can read that, God has Moses turn aside right, to see this bush that is burning but not consumed. God makes Moses, captures his attention. But in that interaction, what does Moses learn and what do we learn? But that it's actually God who's turned aside. God who is attentive. God whose heart is burning with a passion for his people. I've seen, I've heard, I know, I've come. God acts. Where do you hear cries rising up in the world today? On the border with people fleeing from Haiti. In Israel-Palestine, a conflict that never seems to end. Where do you hear cries rising up? Where is creation groaning? Where is a neighbor in Weld County or Larimer weary from the weight of life's circumstances? Where is a friend asking for help? I don't know how you imagine God. I don't know how you picture God, but scripture attests that the God of the gospel is not indifferent to their cries. Not the unmoved mover who simply sent the spinets, pl- <laughs> sent the planets spinning and then stepped back. God is one who draws near and acts attentively. I see, I hear, I know. I've come. This past week, I got a text from one of my um, doctor of ministry colleagues, Henry. Henry is from Myanmar, a country in Southeast Asia that maybe you know has been going through terror as a coup has started back in February. Um, 
Henry sent our whole group um, a BBC story. Uh, the title of the story or the headline was Myanmar, whole town flees amid fierce fighting. It's a picture of 20 homes set ablaze. And the story goes on to tell about how 8,000 residents, mothers, fathers, children, have fled from that town in the face of fierce fighting between militia and army forces. A cry rises up. Henry sent this to us, and underneath the story simply wrote seven words. Becoming more stressful, need more prayer, Emmanuel. Becoming more stressful, need more prayer, Emmanuel. What is Henry doing with that pain for his people, his homeland, but lifting it up to the God who says, I see, I hear, I have come down. The God of the gospel is not indifferent, but acts in the face of the world's cries, acts for his world. And we have seen that action and know it fully, finally, in the sending of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son, sent by the Father in the power of the Spirit to be God's burning heart for his people. Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is God come down to deliver us from the bondage of our sin and injustice which we do to one another. Jesus is God lifting us up in his resurrection and drawing us out of the country of death into a good and broad land, the land of salvation here and now and in the time to come. Jesus is God saying, I have come. A cry rises and God responds, I have. It's the first thing we see here. It's what Moses has to see first. But it's also important that we then see the next thing God says. Maybe equally important. God says, I have. And then God says, I will. Did you hear this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the cry of the Israelites has come to me. I've seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, Moses. I will send you to Pharaoh to deliver my people. I have come down to deliver, so come, I will send you to deliver. I will send you. Um, Moses, of course, has a very unique relationship to all this. Some of you might know the story. Um, if not, here's a recap. Moses was born into slavery as a Hebrew, but in order to save his life, he was sent down the river in a basket by his mother, only to be found by the daughter of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. So Moses is born a Hebrew, but he's raised an Egyptian. Safe to say he probably had some identity issues growing up, some confusion about what, who he was, and in fact, a day comes when Moses sees a Hebrew, who he is by blood, being beaten by an Egyptian whose house he's raised in, and he steps in and kills the Egyptian. So then Moses just flees for his life. Right? He leaves the place of pain. He leaves the confusion. He goes to the suburbs, settles down as a shepherd with a family. The last place Moses wants to go is back to that confusing place, back to that place where there's pain, back to that place where there's oppression. And yet, for all the arguments Moses raises here and later in the chapter, God counters all of them with the only words that actually make Moses fit for the task. God says, I will be with you. I will send you. It's your mission. You've got to do this, Moses. But I will be with you. It's actually my mission. It's about me working through you. I will send you. I will be with you. God says, I will, which is also what God says to us, church. I will send you, Timnath. I will send you to the place of pain to bear my concern for those who are there. I will send you to the place of heartache 
to show my burning heart for my world and my people. I will send you to demonstrate my deliverance, not as saviors, you're not the savior, but as those whom the savior is with and therefore as those who have everything they need to be, as Jesus says, my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, in Timnath, Windsor, Fort Collins, northern Colorado, to the ends of the earth, wherever God sends you. As the Father has sent the Son, Christ, so the Son sends us in his spirit to be his body in the world until he comes again. I will send you. Which, I'm guessing, makes some of us, me, like a little nervous, like Moses. I'm happy to say, like Moses, here I am when God draws me in. Right? I'm a little less happy, right? Like Moses, I want to say, who am I when God sends me out? You hear that chain? Moses says, here I am at the beginning. And then he says, oh, who am I? We have a thousand reasons that we don't want to go back to the place of hurt, out to the dark corners, into the tough relationships. The problem is this is just always what God's doing. He is always drawing us into his holy presence to transform us and then send us out to bear his presence in our wood shop and at the stables and at work and at school and wherever he sends us. He takes Abraham and he says, I'll bless you so that all the families of the earth may be blessed. He takes David, the shepherd boy, and anoints him so that he may be the shepherd of his people. He takes Mary, the virgin, says, I am with you so that she may become the living burning bush in whom the living God dwells without consuming her. God draws us into his presence and then sends us out. So could it be that all the places you thought of earlier where cries are rising up, the places you thought of where creation is groaning, where a neighbor is weary from a weight they're carrying, where a friend is lonely, could it be you thought of those places, those people? Because God, those are the places that God is turning you aside to see, like Moses. To say, look, I see this. I know them. I have come to be with them. And so, therefore, I send you. I will send you to bear my beating heart for them, for that situation. God says, I will send you. And we say, who am I? And God says, I will be with you. I will. And therefore, you have everything you need to be God's witness in that place. I have, I will. Those are God's responses. The last response, though, of course, is one of the most famous ones. God says, I am. Moses says, okay, I'm going to go and say, hey, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you. They're going to ask, who are you? What should I say? What's your name? God says, I am who I am, or translated differently, I am who I will be. Now, maybe when God says, I am who I will be, God is simply, surely saying, I exist. That's who I am. As opposed to all the other deities in the ancient pantheon who were tied to some particular activity, God of war, God of fertility, God of harvest, the Lord says, I, I can't be pinned down like that. You can't just name me and define me by one attribute. I don't just do that thing. I just simply am. I exist simply, purely, freely, needing no one and nothing. I am. Or maybe when God says, I am who I am, the Lord is saying, who I am is who I was yesterday and who I will be tomorrow. Who I am is who I was yesterday and who I will be tomorrow. Which is to say, in other words, I am steadfast. I am faithful. I am sure. And yes, while I am the God who is 
free unto myself, existing unto myself, needing no one or nothing. In my perfect freedom, I have decided to pin myself down into particular places with particular people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that my faithfulness might be known to them. And I have decided to exist not just for myself, but for them. So who am I? The God who I was with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I am today, and I will be with you now, Moses, with you now, Israel, with you now, church. That's who I am, the steadfast one, the faithful one, today. And that is the one, God, who meets us at this table, today, here, now. At this table, God says, I have come down. I have seen, I have heard, I have come. And here he gives us signs that we can taste and see of his deliverance. Nothing less than his whole life given for us. From here, God says, I will send you. Take my body so that you might be my body in this community. Here, God says, I will be with you. In fact, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Miriam, Joseph, Deborah, Mary. I am the God revealed to you in Jesus Christ. I am with you now. I am. I have. I will. I am. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you stand in body or spirit? Having heard God's word, we're invited to respond. And one of the ways the church has historically responded is by confessing the faith that we've inherited. And we do that now with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can be seated. So the Lord says, I am with you now, and I am the God who is for you. Taste and see. This is the Lord Jesus' table. And he invites people from north, south, east, and west to come and feast with him here. This is a table of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. Because here we come to remember all that God has done for us and for this world, especially in the sending of Jesus Christ, who lived and died and rose again and now reigns for us. We remember here we come to have communion with Christ, real fellowship through the Holy Spirit. And here we come in hope of the day when we'll not just feast at a table during a pandemic, but when we will feast with all God's people in the kingdom of God and all things are new. Remembrance, communion, and hope. With that hope then, let us go to God in prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our praise and praise. It is right 
God, and our greatest duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places. O Lord, our God, almighty and everlasting Father, you are the one who has given us life and being and preserved us with your providence. But you've shown us the fullness of your love by sending into the world your word made flesh, Jesus Christ, for us and for our salvation. For this precious gift of a mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you, we praise and bless you, O God. And with all the saints on earth and all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name, singing together, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. You are holy. And blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son. In this meal, we remember his perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross for the sin of the whole world. And in the joy of his resurrection, in anticipation of his coming again, we now offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. And we trust the mystery of the faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. So send your Holy Spirit upon us now as we wait, that this bread which we break and this cup which we bless may be to us a communion in the body and blood of Christ. And grant that as these grapes have been gathered from many hills into one cup and these grains from many fields into one loaf, even so your church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, as we wait, we pray, come, Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant Sealed in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. So as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, the Apostle Paul says, we do proclaim the saving death of our Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning we're going to receive communion um, by inviting you to come forward. The elders will come and receive and then turn to extend that invitation to you. Um, ushers will dismiss you by rows up the center and you can return back along the sides. Um, we hope for a day when we don't have, have to take as many precautions because of the pandemic, um, but the elements are ready for you in the safest ways that we see fit right now. And if you, um, if you can't make your way up here but wish to receive communion, uh, it would be an honor and a gift for one of our, uh, or our elders to serve you where you are. So I'd invite the elders to come forward now. salvation. Mike, the bread of life and the cup of salvation. bread of life and the cup of salvation.
Mike, the bread of life. And the cup of salvation. Friends, come, for all things are now ready.
Friends, since we've been fed and nourished at this table today, um, we turn to God with grateful hearts and trusting hearts, um, lifting up our prayers. Are there any prayers uh, in this community that need to be shared today? There were two that came to me uh, via some prayer cards. One is for a, a family of nine, mom, dad, and seven children who were met at a restaurant yesterday going from Bozeman, Montana, down to Texas. And so we simply pray for them. They're going to their grandmother's funeral uh, for traveling safeties for this family of nine. Holy God, you're the one who, um, who saw and who heard your people, Israel, and so we trust that you are the one who sees this family as they're on the road. And we ask that you would give them traveling mercies, that you would also prepare their hearts to have space to grieve the loss of a grandmother, but also rejoice in your promises of resurrection. Together we pray, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. There was also a prayer request for um, Bruce and Lisa Fuller. Bev, did you want to say more about that? church 20 years ago. Um, Bruce got very sick very suddenly yesterday and they flighted him to, from their home in Montana to the, or for the hospital they were at in Montana to Spokane and they found out he had a brain bleed. They did surgery. Um, he came, sorry, he came through surgery fine. Um, but he was also tested for COVID and he came back positive. He's a high school teacher up in the, Mon in the area in Montana that he's in. Um, I got a note from his sister this morning that said um, he has some movement in his hand and arms, but nothing in his legs yet. He'll be in ICU for three weeks. The next 24 hours are critical. Um, they appreciate our prayers. Uh, and again, he tested positive for COVID, so his wife and his daughters who traveled in from other parts of the state uh, can't see him for 10 days. So um, continued prayers for them. And then Frank, thank you for the beautiful flowers in, in uh, memory of Mitzi, appreciate that. So we pray for the Fullers. God, once again, as we've heard in your word, you are the one who says, I've come down and I will send you. So we pray that you would work now through the hands of those whom you've sent and skilled to be doctors and nurses, um, that, that you, they, you, they would work with Bruce, and that through their hands and through their hearts and through their care, uh, we would see and know your care. Uh, but in all things, no matter what, Lord, we entrust his life to you. And we pray these things trusting that you hear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let's continue then to pray for the world. And this morning on this World Communion Sunday, we lift up prayers together that have been prayed by Christians for hundreds of years, continuing to pray together, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For the peace from above, for your loving kindness, and for our salvation, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For the peace of the world, for the unity of the church, and for the well-being of all peoples, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For this gathering of the faithful, for all who offer here worship and praise, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For all the baptized, all who serve in the church, pastors, presbyters, elders, and every member sent by you, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for our president, the leaders of the nations, and for all in roles of authority. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for this town, every city and community around us, and for those who live in them. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for the good earth which you have given us and for the wisdom and will to keep it. 
We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For those who travel by land, water, or air, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For the aged and the infirm, widowed and orphaned, for the sick and the suffering, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For the poor and oppressed, for the unemployed and destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For deliverance in times of affliction, strife, need, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For those things which we name only in silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. In the communion of saints, we commend ourselves, one another, and a whole life to your care, trusting that you do indeed hear, you do indeed act in us and through us, and you do receive us as your own in Jesus Christ. Through his name and spirit, we ask all these things and pray now the words he taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As God has given us life and being, so we give ourselves back to God. Let's take our morning offering. Sings flow, praise God from creatures here below. Praise out above ye, heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen, 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 amen. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, for giving us life and breath and for preserving us, for giving us one another as a fellowship, members of your body, for giving us sure signs in your word of your care, your concern, your attentiveness, your action in this world that you made good and will to redeem in Jesus. For all these things and more, we bless you. And we pray that as we give ourselves back to you, you would use these gifts and our lives to be a blessing to our neighbors 
in this community. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear friends, as you go into the world this week, God's world, which God loves and acts in and calls you to act in, remember that Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and he also said, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill can't be hid. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the room. So in the same way, let your light shine this week before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to God in heaven. And now may you receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. For truly, in Jesus Christ, the peace of God is yours. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve.